It's not one or the other. It's hard truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known and loved by you. I'm fully known and loved by you. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find the reasons why you give me so much. How real, how wide, how rich, how high is your heart? I cannot find the reasons why you give me so much. I'm fully known and loved by you. You won't let go, no matter what. I do. It's not one or the other. It's our truth and ridiculous grace to be known, fully known and loved by you. I'm fully known and loved by you. So unusual, it's frightening. I'm fully known. And love by you. this on now can you hear me all right sorry you have to look at me all right just to get this out of the way this is for work one time a year I'm gonna cover it up soon okay just so you know I'm not trying to look like my father <laughs> I heard that comment this morning yeah yeah I'm adopted remember I'm adopted yeah uh, I can say, if you don't mind, let's, let's pray together before we get started. Lord, we love you and we thank you for allowing us to gather here, Lord, with our brothers and sisters. Lord, as mentioned earlier, we got, we've got a lot of stuff that's, uh, that's on our hearts and minds, Lord. Uh, loved ones with, with sickness, uh, just a lot of anxiety and fear, Lord, uh, in the situations of life that come up. Lord, we pray that you'd help us to trust in you. And Lord, we pray that you'd help us to hear the message that you have for us today and that we apply it in our lives. We love you. And we thank you for being good to us. Here's something let me pray. Amen. What's I think is always, I guess, I call it funny, I don't know, is how the Lord works everything out. The Lord's timing is, is, is pretty neat, and his choices are pretty neat. Uh, Any time that I have, that, that you all give me the chance to speak up here, I've never told anyone or, or said, you know, why don't you sing something like this or sing something for this. But all of the songs today go along with the message. And all the prayer requests that have been made revolve around the same thing. And that's what we're going to be talking about today. Uh, talking about being in control of our lives. You know, a lot of us think that we are in control of our lives. We think that we are in control of our lives. But when, we're, when we actually look at it, you know, we have no control at all. Whether or not we want to recognize that is the difference, you know, and give the control to the Lord. But we're going to look at, uh, at a few men who are in complete control. Uh, we'll see if we can figure that out as we go along. So we're going to start off in Acts chapter 12. If you want to turn there, I'll give you just a second. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 6. This is probably pretty familiar with a lot of you. It says, Now about that time, Herod and the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread. And when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter or after the Passover to bring him forth to the people. God bless you. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. 
Here's the key verse. And when Herod would have brought him forth, the same night Peter was sleeping between two soldiers, bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. Hopefully you caught that. We're going to read one more verse and go back to it. Or one more part. Uh, on over in Acts chapter 16, verses 22 through 25. Acts 12 was talking about Peter. This right here we're talking about Paul and Silas is with him. So verse 22 says, And the multitude rose up together against them, and the magistrates rent off their clothes and commanded to beat them. And when they had laid many stripes upon them, they cast them into the prison, charging the jailer to keep them safely or securely. Who, having received such a charge, thrust them into the inner prison and made their feet fast in the stocks. And at midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. Hopefully right now you're thinking, he is crazy. What does two people being in prison have to do with being in control? If you notice, though, well, actually, if you, if you remember a couple weeks back when we spoke, one of the things we said was uh, to get ourselves in control, we have to get this self under his control, right? So true control is not necessarily controlling one's circumstances in life, but it's controlling your actions and reactions to those circumstances. We are... Our responses to our circumstances, they should be... They're governed by living out our faith. That's what Paul and Silas and Peter were doing in this case. They did not allow their circumstances in life to affect them. If you, you know, it's amazing when you think they, they got Peter, they arrested Peter after they had just killed, killed James. Peter was going to be another martyr. He was going to be the second martyr. But it happened to be the time of Passover, so obviously they didn't want to do anything then, break the, break the rules there. But they were going to wait, and after Passover, they are going to kill him. But Peter, knowing that, still had enough peace about him and to know that, you know what, the Lord's got this, that he was asleep. He was asleep in prison. That blows my mind, that he had enough peace about that to say, you know what, I'm not worried about this. If I, if I go or if I stay, what, he's a winner either way, right? Paul and Silas... You know, they, they were, uh, right before this, you know, Lydia had just been saved, and so they were leaving her, and they were walking back. And this, it talks about a, a young damsel who was possessed with an evil spirit, uh, basically was kind of heckling them. And it said that Paul got greatly annoyed with her. I thought that was a good choice of words. But he was annoyed with her, so he turns around, and he tells that spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ, get out of her. Leave her alone. And so when that happened... Her masters lost money because they were using this, this young damsel for profit. They were getting her to, uh, she was a soothsayer, she was a fortune teller. And so once they lost their money, they wanted to throw charges against them. So that's where that came about. So they got them, they arrested them, they stripped them down naked, they beat them, then they cast them into prison and put, put uh, shackles and stocks on their feet. But yet, they did not allow their circumstances to control them either. Their faith overcame that. They were singing hymns and praying. That's amazing. I, I, I would pray that my faith would be that strong. But I, I don't see it, to be honest. I don't see that. But neither one let the circumstances control their actions. Faith should be our controller in every situation every circumstance whether it is good or bad we should not lose our faith because of that but we have trouble we have trouble a lot of times i know i have trouble a lot of times in living my faith when the circumstances are not what i want them to be and it's the same for all of us because it boils down to one thing that's fear now as soon as we say fear a lot of times what's the first response we get i ain't afraid of nothing i ain't afraid of nothing Fight a grizzly bear with a switch in the woods at night. That's what Ray Stevens says. Ain't scared of anything. But fear, fear is a broad spectrum. All right? if, you, if you look up the definition of fear, uh, Merriam Webster says that it is an unpleasant, often strong emotion caused by anticipation or awareness of danger or the unknown. All right? but 
when you look at the entire spectrum, fear is just talking about, it implies anxiety, a nervousness about what's going to happen, usually with a loss of courage. All right? The extreme parts of fear, which include fright, alarm, panic, and terror, a lot of times those don't affect us as much. You know, we live in eastern Kentucky. We, we're really not concerned with, if we go out and we preach the gospel, that somebody's going to come and arrest us and throw us in and put shackles on us or to beat us. Thank the Lord. You know, we, we really don't have to worry about that in our area. But that's not the spectrum, that's not the part of the fear that affects us, especially as Christians. You hear words like dread or trepidation. Those are the ones that get us. Dread talks about adding an idea of intense reluctance to face a situation. It suggests aversion and anxiety. You see dread in churches when the pastor, when, when, when everything is coming to a close and the pastor is looking for somebody to pray. And what happens? Oh, don't look at me. I'm, I'm reading my Bible, pastor. Don't call on me to pray. I'm, I'm looking. We have that. It's, it's, it's a normal thing in a Christian walk, but it, it shouldn't be. We should never be afraid to pray to our Maker. We should never be afraid, be afraid no matter if it's by ourselves or if it's with, with 100 people. That shouldn't bother us. Trepidation implies timidness, or timidity is the word. I didn't think that was real, but it is. So if you're timid, it says lacking in courage or self-confidence, lacking in boldness or determination. What does it tell us, though? What's the Bible tell us? He did not give us a spirit of fear, but of boldness. He tells us, look, these are the promises that I give you. Be bold about them. Be bold in your faith. Don't waver. Those are the ones that seem to apply to us more. The little ones. The things that we don't really think of as fear. Peter and Paul, again, they had no fear because they knew who was in control and they, have, they, they were able to be reminded because of things in the past that, that, uh, that had taken place. Again, the control, that, the control that they gave up, I guess, is what strengthens their faith. When we try to have control ourselves, we lessen our faith because we lessen God's power. We say, no, it's okay, Lord, I've got this, when we know we can't. You know, there's a lot of fears for Christians in the church setting. Not just the praying in front of people. I've had a lot of people tell me that. That's, they tell me, at one point in time, I was afraid to pray in church because I thought, man, what if I mess up? Lord knows it. He knows your heart. You get up, you pray, and say, Lord, thank you for this morning, and it's 8 o'clock at night. He knows that. He knows your intent. We have fears of praying in church. We have fears of visiting somebody. How many times have you said to yourself, don't raise your hand, how many times have you said to yourself, I know I have, when you go out and you get invited to go on visitation, you say, well, I can't, I can't talk to somebody about Jesus. What if, what if they ask me something I don't know? What if it's somebody I work with? What if it's this? What if it's that? And we start, we start making excuses. Teaching a Sunday school class. I don't want to teach anybody wrong, so I'm just not going to do it. That way, that way I won't have to teach them wrong. That's an excuse. That's fear. Singing a song in church. Great job, by the way, again, Cade and Amber. I'm... I'm I'm blessed to see young people get up here and not be afraid. That's awesome. That's awesome. But singing a song, you know, a lot of times in church, not even up here on stage, but where you're sitting, we start to sing the song. We'll sing Amazing Grace. And what do we do? Amazing Grace, my sweet child. Save wretch like me, yeah. We don't sing out because the person standing beside us, we're like, man, what if they know how I really sing? What's the Bible tell us? What's he say? He says, make a joyful what? Noise. The key word, though, is joyful. 
The Lord doesn't care what your voice sounds like. He wants, he wants that joy from your heart when you're singing to Him. Belt it out. If you're by me, I'm sorry. You're going to hear it. I like to sing, and I know I am not a canary. You know, I've, I grew up hearing my mama sing all the time. I get to hear Nola sing all the time. I'm not a canary. I'm more like a crow. I'm a young crow. But, you know, singing makes me happy. It reminds me, you know, it reminds me of a lot of the promises that God gives us because a lot of songs are derived from Scripture, the ones that you all sang about today, known. It tells us that. In life, outside of church, yes, I know church is real life, but outside of here, we're also swamped with fears. Many were mentioned this morning. We have a lot of decisions and things come up, situations come up in life, and we don't know which way to go. We're like, Lord, what am I supposed to do here? We allow that fear to seep in. So we take a little bit of God's power. We try to take a little bit of God's power from him. We never do. He's still all-powerful. But we try to take that power from him when we don't allow him to do what he does. When our health fails us, man, how, how big we think we are until something small gets us. I know one time I, we had a stomach virus. And it's one of them times where you think, man, I wish just put me under. Bad. We, we, we are so weak when it comes to stuff like that. Something so small can affect us. When the health of a loved one starts to deteriorate, and it's not us, but we see someone else, that hurts. It's fear. When a loved one passes away, it's fear. We start the, we start the cycle, you know, Fear of the unknown, what might happen. We start playing that what-if game. I know I do that all the time. I would say that you all are not unlike me there. What if this happens? What are we going to do? What if this happens? What are we going to do? Remember that fear spectrum we talked about, anxiety is on that spectrum. That worry about the unknown, the constant worry. And well, things are going good right now, so something bad is getting ready to happen. We have to change our mindset. We can't think like that. We cannot allow our fear to undermine God's power. And our circumstances shouldn't lessen our faith. The Lord tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, 13. It's one of my favorite verses. It says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man. But God is faithful who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape, that ye may be able to bear it. And that last part there, that ye may be able to bear it, is a, another way of saying it is ye may be able to endure it. It's not an escape like, okay, here's my problem, Lord, pull me out of that problem. That's not what this verse is talking about. This verse is talking about the Lord is faithful to us, for us to not have fear and not be afraid because he will see us through it. What's funny is, uh, me and another guy at work, he's, he's a young Christian, young in, in, in not being a Christian for long. We actually got to talk about this this week. A situation came up, we had a little issue with our unit, and he said, I wish it would just fix itself. And I said, well, if it fixes itself, we ain't going to learn what the problem was. The Lord's like, Pfft. I thought, yeah, I know, Lord, you're talking to me, I know. If he fixes our problems for us, and he pulls us out of them, we don't rely on him. We don't take that, that gut check and look at ourselves and say, okay, what, where is my faith at and what needs to change with it? But he sees us through those to help us to grow. We are supposed to continually grow in our faith. Never be satisfied. But in that, talk about, it, it talks about a port to land. That's what that refers to in uh, 1 Corinthians 10, 13. So make sure when you're reading that, that you know, I would mark that one down. Anytime you're going through struggles, that you always remember, you are going to come through this as a Christian. You are going to come through this as a winner. Whatever that ending is, you're still going to be a winner because he is faithful to us. Now, a lot of times when we think of fear, you know, fear is a tool of the devil. 
We all know that. He uses that to, to make us doubt, to make us worry, and to make us anxious, and all that stuff. But fear can be a tool for us. If we use it, if we turn it around and use it appropriately, taking that negative and turn it into a positive, right? If we don't have fear, we would have no courage. Fear strengthens our courage. We find our courage when we are afraid. One of the most scared times in my life, I don't know if mom ever even knows this, but uh, we lived on Brush Creek. Right? Brush Creek was out in the country. We had a red barn, big barn, and it was about 58 strides, like not walking steps, but strides from the barn to the front door of the house. I know that because I ran them because of my fear. They never let us watch a lot of scary movies when we was young. I realized that afterwards. But I had somehow gotten enough of a movie called Nightmare on Elm Street that I learned about a guy named Freddy Krueger. I didn't even watch the whole movie. I just watched a little bit. It was enough. So I'm eight, nine years old, ten. And so when we would play in the barn, I would most time be the last one playing. And I would lose track of time and it would get dark. I would realize that, oh, man, this is not good. So you go to the door of the barn and the first thing you do, you look out. I'm looking for him. In my mind, I know he's not real, but I'm playing the what if game. What if by chance there is somebody out there? I didn't know if I was more afraid of him or more afraid of getting in trouble from mom and dad for not being home at a certain time. So I thought, you know, I've got to go. I've got to go. I can't stay here overnight. So I'd get to that door. Say, okay, on the count of three, I'm gone. One, two, let me look one more time just to make sure he's not here. Every time. Let me take off to the house, and it was 58 strides, whether I, if I could jump the log that we used to have, the sitting log that was there, and go between the two apple trees, or it was about 64 strides if I went around the apple trees to the front porch. I would get to that front porch, get in the house, I'm fine. Why are you panting for? I'm good, nothing, I'm good. I knew I was safe in there. I knew my mom and dad had me. It's no different in our life. It's no different in my walk right now. Things come up, I want to play the what-if game. We want to worry about things that most of the time will never happen. Instead of resting in the security of the Lord and His faithfulness to us. Fear can strengthen our faith if we use God's promises to overcome it. If you look in Psalms 94.19, It says, in the multitude of my thoughts within me, thy comforts delight my soul. Another way, uh, the word thoughts right there, another way of saying it is, in the multitude of my anxious thoughts. That's another interpretation. So with all the fears that he has going through him, his comforts in the Lord delight his soul. This is David, who was a man after God's own heart. We can't allow fear to control our actions or our reactions to the circumstances. We have to draw closer to God by using that as a tool. If, you, if, we, if we do that, if we remember His works and remember His promises, then we get to see the end result of our faith overcoming our fear. If you go back and you look at Peter and Paul, what happened at the end of those stories, it talks about at the end of the Peter uh, in chapter 12, it talks about and uh, the brethren were strengthened and multiplied. And if you look at uh, chapter 16 with, with Paul, when the Philippian jailer got, got saved, him and his entire household got saved. So that's an entire family, entire generations that are coming to be our brothers and sisters. We'll meet them one day as a result of one person, or with Paul and Silas, so living out their faith. But it's living out their faith. It's not just having faith. It's living it out. One of the neat things when you read that, when you go on to read that story, is not 
uh, it's not about the earthquake, because that's when the earthquake took place, you know, and it, it freed him. It was the faith of Paul and Silas to be singing and praying in their circumstances that they were in. That is what saved that Philippian jailer's life. It was their testimony. That's all we have as Christians. We have our faith in the Lord and we have our testimony that others see. If we act the same, if situations come up that we don't like and, and we, you know, we start pouting or we start whining, we start complaining, we start all the what-ifs in life, they're not going to see the Lord. They're not going to see any difference. Why would they say, I want to have what you have? They say, I've already got what you've got. You just say you're a Christian. You're not showing me any difference. That's a tough pill to swallow sometimes. As we come here this morning, when, uh, when we got in the car, we was kind of laughing. A couple of my favorite songs played back to back, and they were, they were talking about fear. To me, that was kind of reassurance, like, okay, Lord, I know this, this was what you wanted me to speak on today. This is what the Lord's been blasting to me. Uh, Fear is a liar. You all heard that song? That's Samuel's favorite song. He may sing it for you one day. I guess that. that one. And then there's, a, there's another song. It's called the Breakup Song. But it's about breaking up with fear. One of the first lines, fear you don't own me. I love that line. They both played this morning on the way to church. I thought that was cool. But one of, one of my favorite songs, one of my current favorite songs, is a song written by Mark Hall of Casting Crowns. I don't know if you know who he is or know his story. Uh, been a lead singer forever, youth pastor for 20-some years. Went through cancer treatments recently and stuff. And when he was going through those cancer treatments, uh, he wrote a song called Oh My Soul. And it'll tear you up. There's a line in that song that I say to myself on a regular basis. I, I'd say multiple times a day. It says, there's a place where fear has to face the God you know. That line sticks with me. because I remember, no matter what I have in this life that scares me, or that I am anxious about, or that I am worried about, or that I make, make excuses to not do, Pretty soon, that fear has to face the promises that I know of my Lord. And when I say that line to myself, I start smiling. Because I know God's got this. He's got it. Quit worrying, go about my day. He's got this. If you look in Psalms 27, that's our last verse we're going to look at. Psalms 27, verse 14. It says, wait on the Lord, be of good courage, and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. That wait is wait in faith. Wait in faith on the Lord. Be of good courage, and he will strengthen thine heart. We know his promises. We believe his promises. We have to live his promises. We have to live what we say today as we have our invitation I would ask that you, you, you take a look inside at whatever it is that's making you anxious whatever it is that you've been worried about whatever it is the situations that you realize I have no control and that you would just turn them over to the Lord whether you come down front or you do it in your seat that's up to you but I pray that you do that today if you don't mind bow with me in prayer Lord, we thank you for loving us. Lord, we thank you for, for knowing us and still loving us. Lord, we thank you for giving us the promise, Lord, that we don't have to live in fear, we don't have to live with worry or doubt, that we know that you will take care of every situation we have, that you will, you will take care of us, Lord. We are, we are so much more than the sparrows. Lord, we pray today that you help us to apply this in our life, and we ask that you'd give us guidance in all that we do. In your son's name we pray. Amen.